not sure what it's all about. Hold on, Francis. Could we have the mic on, please? Can you hear me now? Okay, all right. Um, happy Sabbath or blessed Sabbath to everyone. Um, I'm just going to do an announcement of the Balmoral Show. Um, does anybody know what the Balmoral Show is all about? There's no hands up, so I'm going to have to explain just exactly what it's about. The Balmoral Show is a show that is run every year here in Northern Ireland, and it's an agricultural show and it's held at Balmoral Park near Lisburn, and it's sponsored by the Ulster Bank, and it, it, it has many aspects to it, including show jumping, bands, shopping, and tasting. Now, there are a lot of animals there, and poultry, and farm machinery, and it is a time when the country meets the city people, or the townies, whichever you like. And it's a time when people can be as a community together. And we will never get the opportunity to meet these people in the country like this opportunity that God has given us at the Balmoral Show. There are 110,000 people go to the Balmoral Show in those four days. Can you imagine if we were given out leaflets to meet those that they've just done with MindFit? So we have these people on our doorstep. And this Balmoral Shore starts on the 15th of May and runs right through to the 18th of May. Also in that show, we have a, what we call trade stands. And this is in one massive big building. It's huge, it's a beautiful building. And the church has been blessed that we have been able to secure one of those stands. And that stand number is number 16. Keep that in your mind. And. Uh, a good while ago, I'm sure it's two months, maybe more, three months, I gave out leaflets and there were over 20 people who had volunteered to man these stands. Now you know who you are, but it's very important that you know exactly what you need to do and you need to feel comfortable within yourself. So we have set next Sunday morning, which is the 21st, from 10 o'clock, no later than 12, we should be out of here to go through every aspect of that show and to tell you what you're going to do. We're hoping and praying about this show. And uh, there's, that's one thing, apart from the 20 volunteers that we have, that the whole church can do. And I'm convinced more and more and more that prayer is so important because without prayer, we go in our own steam and we will fail. But with prayer, the Holy Spirit will go before us and he will pave the way. So next Sunday morning, I am inviting you to the church where we will be able to talk through exactly what you're doing at the stand and will be expected of you. And if you have any questions, keep it. The other thing, we are hoping to give, give out over 1,200 pieces of literature. And we need God to, to move people to the stand. So please, please pray about that. And if, if anyone else wants to volunteer, even at this late stage, don't, be, don't feel, come forward and let me know, and we'll certainly uh, add you to the list. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you, Francis. Uh, if anybody wants to know more, do speak to Francis about it. Uh, it's a good opportunity. Now, I would like to just welcome you all here to our main service this morning. You're all very welcome. It's great to see you here, and I hope that you will be blessed uh, through worshiping together with us here this morning. And I'd like to welcome all those who are watching online as well. I'm just going to bring a few announcements. We do have a bulletin, um, and this is the bulletin. Uh, I hope you all have access to one, um, but in any case, it, it has the church program for today and also the announcements, uh, so I'm just going to go over some of the announcements now. Um, you probably are well aware that the MindFit uh, Mental Health Seminar is running at the moment in Stranmillis University. It's running uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday evening from 7 until 8.15. Uh, it has been announced uh, over a number of weeks, and we've had brochures on this. 
Um, I'm sure some of you, well, I know some of you have been there. I have been there uh, as well. Uh, it's tonight, uh, again, at 7 o'clock, Stranmillis University. That's just over, it's very close to here, actually, um, just at the far end of Stranmillis Road. You'll be able to look it up uh, on your phone. Um, so that is on again this evening. You're very welcome to come. And also, if you have a friend that uh, you, you think might benefit from this, bring them along as well. There is plenty of seating. So that's this evening, 7 o'clock to about a quarter past 8 uh, in Stranmillis University. Um, you'll probably hear more about this. Um, Alex Rodriguez, who is preaching this morning, he's the one who's running this program, um, and no doubt he will uh, say something more about it. Also today, uh, is there, there's a women's ministry program, uh, and those who generally go to the women's ministry uh, meetings would be aware of this. Uh, bring along your lunch. If you haven't, if you don't know about this, and you're a woman, and you would like to attend, it's at two o'clock, it's from two to three, and it will be sharing testimonies today. So if you're coming along and you have a testimony you would like to share, well, you can bring that along this afternoon at two o'clock. And then the other two uh, announcements, which are the two announcements we have every week, that is the uh, prayer meeting on Wednesday evening via Zoom, and the study of Christ's object lessons via Zoom on a Monday evening, and details are in the um, brochure, in the bulletin. Uh, and that's all the announcements I have uh, at the moment. Um, I would just invite us now, as we come into an attitude of praise and worship, that we bow our heads together uh, and have a short prayer. So I'd invite you now just to bow your heads. Our dear Lord and loving Father in heaven, dear Lord, we thank you for the opportunity we have to come aside from our everyday lives, from the cares of every day, and that we can experience something of special time with you, and also special time with those of like faith. Lord, we pray for each one here today that your Holy Spirit will have opportunity to speak to our hearts and to our minds. We pray especially for those who will lead out, that your words will be in their mouths, and that your Holy Spirit will speak to all of us to speak to our hearts, that we will be encouraged and strengthened and Lord, that your will will be done in our lives and that we will be willing for that. So we pray all of this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. With Jesus' joy in our hearts, we'd like to rise as we take the intro as a church. Shall we all rise? Yeah. 
Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, thank you again for the Sabbath and for bringing us together. Lord, we're asking this morning that your spirit be poured out on us. In fact, uh, as we heard in Sabbath school, we can't do anything without your spirit. And so, Father, here we are. We don't deserve you, but you've promised to bless us. And so we're asking for a Sabbath blessing today as we go through this program. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The song said this morning, we will take the first song will be Jesus Save. We will have a joyful song. And the second one will be Shine, Jesus Shine. Happy in your heart as we do it together. Amen.
Amen. Brothers and sisters, that was beautiful to hear you guys praising God in worship. As a reading this morning, I want to share a quote by Nancy Spiegelberg. She says, Lord, I crawled across the barrenness to you with my empty cup, uncertain in asking any small drop of refreshment. If only I had known you better, I would have come running with a bucket. You know, all that we have, all, all that we have in this life, God has either provided or allowed uh, for us. Everything that we have has come from God. So why do we come crawling with an empty cup? Psalm 84 tells us that no good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Let us bring our buckets to God. As we consider this, let us also consider our response. And as such, at this time, I encourage our deacons to come forward to collect our tithes and free will offerings. And as we give, let us do what we can do to be part of God's work in spreading the gospel. So if you can come forward, please. Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so grateful for all that you have done for us. And as we give back a small portion of that, we pray that you will bless it, that you will multiply it, that it can be used for the furtherance of your work. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. everyone who's had a good week yes oh lots of hands lots and lots of hands was it a good week because just we're back at school yes oh that's good Are you back at school too is that why it was a good week yeah who likes going to school who likes to learn <laughs> yeah we all like to learn don't we and we've all got lots and lots to learn. Even old people have lots to learn, haven't we? Well, I think before I start, I'm going to have to take a wee drink. Very, very thirsty up here. Hold on a minute. Does anybody else want a wee drink? Hold on. Oh, 
there's not much in my jug, is there? It's very empty. There's nothing in this for me to share with anyone, I'm sorry. So hold on till I finish my drink, hold on. Mm, that's lovely and refreshing water. Oh well, my jug is empty. I can't share. What sort of things do we like to share? Um, I forgot. You forgot lots of things? Cookies. Cookies. Who likes to share cookies? <laughs> um, um, doll. Your doll, your toys, cookies, yes. Toys and sweets. Okay, we're very generous here. Share toys. Yeah, what would you like to share? Yeah, shout loud. Chocolate. Okay. Chocolate, sweets, cookies, toys. Fruit salad. Fruit salad. Oh, that's a very nice tasty one to share. Money. Yeah, we can share money, can't we, to help others? I didn't even share my water. But when we have... Oh, let me see, show you this wee thing here now. What have I got on this piece of paper? A heart. Who's got a heart? We've all got a heart, haven't we? Is there much in this heart? Not really. Let's see what happens if I put this heart in the water. Yeah, see what happens when we put this in. Does it do anything? Because if everybody stands back, we if you all sit back and everybody will get to see. So everybody sit down. That's it. When do you see what happens when the heart fills with water? Is there anything happening apart from the heart's getting wet? It's getting full of water, but it's not really doing a big lot, is it? No, there's not really much happening because there's not really an awful lot in that heart to share, is there? It's a bit like my jug. It's not got a lot in it to share. But what happens if we let Jesus into our hearts? What happens? There's enough to share with the whole world. There's enough to share with the whole world. <laughs> enough what to share with the whole world? Enough love. To share. So imagine we had a heart full of love. A heart full of love because Jesus is in our hearts. What will happen to that heart full of love when we put it in the water? Let's just watch and see. What? Let's just, wait. do you think it'll spread? Do you think it'll spread and fill? Like, see the other hearts in this one that has no Jesus in it? Those wee hearts don't have much in them, do they? What's going to happen with this one? Let's hope it spreads well now. No, <gasps> look what's happening. Jesus' love is already spreading outside the heart because we're sharing it with the people around us. So when Jesus is in our hearts and we share Jesus with our friends and family, what happens to Jesus' love? It spreads everywhere, doesn't it? <gasps> look. All those other hearts are now full of Jesus' love. So if you had a jug that was full of Jesus' love, would we be able to share? Yes, we would. And I wouldn't be just sharing the water with myself. I would be sharing it with everyone. And look, not just one heart full of Jesus' love. We now have four hearts full of Jesus' love. So just think... If your heart is full of Jesus' love and you share it with everyone, how many people would learn about Jesus? A lot. So how many kids are here now? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, 60, 61, 62, 63, 64, 65, 66, 67, 68, 69, 70, 71, 72, 73, 74, 75, 76, 77, 78, 79, 80, 81, 82, 83, 84, 85, 86, 87, 88, 89, 90, 91, and more, wouldn't it? If you all told one person, that would be 60 people would know about Jesus. If you all told two people, that would be like 90 people would know about Jesus. So how many people do we want to tell about Jesus? Everybody. 
So this week, when we're learning how to do, how to tell people about Jesus, when as a church we're trying to show the world who Jesus is, what can we as little children do? Can we still spread Jesus' love? We can, can't we? Because no matter how old we are, or how small we are, or how young we are, if our hearts are full of Jesus, then we will share Jesus with the people around us. Who wants to say a big amen to that? Amen. Okay, so thank you very much, everyone. Do you want to go back to your... Well, say we prayer first, and then we'll give you your wee, your wee, your wee bulletins. Does anybody want to say a prayer for me? You want to say a wee prayer? Hello, Yao. Good morning. Forgive my disobedience against my parents. Don't let me make mistakes, but teach me to be educated according to will. Take me to school and give me wisdom and intelligence to learn and understand the subjects. Fix my behavior for my parents and other people. Make me grow in will. Bless my family and others too. May the love, kindness, prosperity, good health, comes greater be here in my home forever. You'll be done. In the name of Yahshua, I say to you, Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Come and get your wee bulletin. Happy Sabbath, Church. The reading, the scripture reading today is coming from Zechariah 10, verse 1. Ask the Lord for rain in the time of the latter rain. The Lord will make flashing clouds. He will give them showers of rain, grass and field for everyone. May the Lord bless the reading. I'll ask the church to kneel as we pray. Those who can. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord. This morning we come before you, sinful as we are. We thank you, Lord, for the Sabbath, the day of rest, as we are gathering here. This may be red as blood. You will wash them to be white as snow. Thank you, Lord, this morning. I want to pray for someone this morning, maybe probably there's someone who is not feeling well. We claim the promise in the book of Psalms, chapter 103, verse 3, for you says, you will forgive our iniquities and you will heal all the diseases. May you heal someone this morning who is not feeling well. In your word, Lord, in the book of uh, Luke, chapter 5, verse 17, you say, the power of the Lord is present to heal someone. Probably, Lord, there is someone who is sick physically, and there is someone who is sick spiritually. May you heal us, Lord, this morning in Jesus' name. We also present your main servant that we have used him, Lord, in many countries, different countries, different churches, and uh, um, different places. We present Pastor Alex this morning as he is going to break the bread of life, may you hold his lips and his brain and bless him in a special way. He is empty, Lord. May you fill him with the Holy Spirit. Continue to bless him and continue to bless his family also. And also, Lord, we pray for each and every one of us that is here. Others did not come here for the different challenges that they have. We also pray for them. Others are watching online, whatever challenges that they have. We pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that you may bless your children. These are the last days and the signs are showing that you are soon to come. And we pray in the name of Jesus 
that, Lord, as we prepare for your second coming, may you prepare also our hearts. This is my humble prayer this morning in the wonderful name of Jesus, who is soon to come. Amen. of desperation I'm to a part you have won but this valley that lies coldly before you cast a shadow you cannot overcome and just when you thought you had it all together to get you through but this time all the sorrow broke more than just your heart and reciting all those verses just won't do Instead of asking why did it happen, think of where it can lead you from here. And as your pain is slowly easing, you can find a greater reason to live your life triumphant through the tears.
Well, good morning. Testing, one, two, can you hear me? How about now? Yeah. Hey, let, listen, I, I want to do something this morning because I am just not used to speaking with a barrier. It's kind of, it's kind of odd. So I'm actually going to go down to where you're at, if that's okay with you guys. Now, all of you that are sitting in the front row, you're like, no. So I've had a good time in, in, uh, in Belfast. Uh, I usually do. This is, this is kind of one of my favorite places. Uh, I think I had shared with you guys last year that I, I told my wife when, when we were here about a year and a half ago that, um, that I could live. I could live here. I could, I could really live here. As we'd walk the roads and drive the streets, I said, you know, honey, I can, I can, I can live here. I can, I can really live here. And I, and I talked to Sean, and I said, Sean, I can, I can live here. We ought, should, we ought to have a Voice of Prophecy office in, in Belfast. And, um, well, that's very difficult to do. But, um, but there are a couple of things that are very difficult in, in, uh, in Northern Ireland and even in, the, in Southern Ireland and down there in the Republic. Um, it's just uh, uh, the problem that I have is walking on the road because... This morning, as I was walking to church, I noticed that this one car was doing sort of a three-point turnaround, and I thought to myself, oh, I can beat that car across to the other side before it gets turned around, because in my mind, I thought that as he jiggled around, he would end up coming in this lane, and by the time that I ended up in this lane, I would be past him. Well, that's not the way it works here. Because by the time I got to this lane, he was right here. And he was very kind. He didn't blow his horn or did anything. But I'm sure he thought that dumb American trying to cross the road. Um, so, it, you know, it, it is, I have found that it is important in, in your country to wait for the little light and the little green man. I don't know. Is it illegal to cross the road if the little, it's not? Yeah. In, in, some, in some cities in the U.S. it is. Because we in the U.S. don't really care about waiting for cars. We just kind of cross when we have an opportunity. But, um, so that, that, that is one thing that I have, I have found here that I need to be careful about. But um, yesterday, um, I think it was you, Emil, that you were talking to me yesterday. And, and as he was talking to me, he, he mentioned something about me having an American accent. <laughs> I never thought about having an American accent. I just thought it was normal. But I guess I do have an American accent. Can you guys can you can you guys understand my American accent? Okay. Yeah. In in, in the U.S., there's there's lots of accents depending on where you go. You've got uh, Maine up in the Northeast, and and those those folks are a little hard to, to 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 understand. Boston and some of those guys, and and down in the Southeast where I'm from, it's a Southern accent, and so my my accent has a bit of a Southern twang to it. Not not necessarily heavy heavy. But I did grow up in the, in the South. I, I, I was born in Puerto Rico. I speak Spanish. And, um, and that kind of balanced me out. I, I learned Spanish and English at the same time as I was growing up. And so some people say, well, you don't, US people say, you don't really have an accent at all. We, don't, we can't really tell where you're from. Um, and that's, that's true the more I get sort of in the West. Where I'm living now, they don't have much of an accent. And then you go West, West, California, and Washington, and those people are just strange. But um, anyway, I just never thought about having an American accent. That's kind of a, a cool thought. Now I can go around the world and I can say, I have an accent. It's, it's, it's an American accent. Um, anyway, I've, I've enjoyed my time here. I've enjoyed the time there with MindFit. If you haven't uh, come out to the MindFit uh, event that we're doing, I just invite you to come. Uh, mental illness is, is a major, major issue in the world today. As we've mentioned in the past, one in eight in the world are struggling with mental illness, one in five uh, of adults in Northern Ireland. And what that means for us as, as a church is that in this church right now, statistically speaking, there are 20%, at least 20% of individuals that are struggling with, with their mental health. Now, we don't like to think that in the church. We wanna think that everything is fine, everything is great, everybody is, is doing good, 
But statistically speaking, uh, there's 20% or more of you right now that are currently struggling with your, with your mental health. And it's something that we need to address as, as a church. So tonight, 7 p.m., I don't remember the school. What's the? Stromilis, yes. At the, at the university, it's a really, really nice facility. I just want to invite each one of you to, to come. I need a clicker. Oh, thank you. Wonderful. All right, let me, let me pray with you, and we'll get started. Father in heaven, thank you again for your blessing and for being with us, Lord. We thank you that you are our God, that you, ah, the Lord, that you give us beyond what we, what we deserve. This morning, Lord, I'm asking that you speak through me. I'm acknowledging, Lord, that I, I really have nothing to offer. I'm, I'm broken. I'm, I, I'm a sinful, Father. I'm, a, I'm in need of Jesus. Uh, but you've selected me to speak this morning, and, and as such, I cling to the promises that you will bless. So this morning, Father, touch my tongue from a, with one of the coals of heaven. Lord, hide me behind your cross and, and speak through me in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll put my wallet in my back pocket because I feel that, that weight every time I walk. It's just kind of hitting me. But uh, All right. One of my favorite places in Scripture, uh, and I was, I was tickled to death with our Sabbath school class because we started talking about the Holy Spirit there at, at the end, and I thought, wow, that's, that's kind of what I'm talking about today. It's kind of cool how the Lord matches topics up. But one of my favorite places in Scripture is the book of Acts, and one of my most favorite stories in Scripture is Acts chapter 2, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, Pentecost. When I think about that story, I get really, really excited because... Man, I would have loved to have been there. How many of you would have loved to have been at Pentecost? I would, only a few. They're like, no, no, we actually like modern bathrooms. We don't want to be back there in those times. I would have loved to have been at Pentecost. Here's Acts chapter 2. It says, if I can get my clicker to work, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Ah, uh, come on. I know you'd want to be there. I would, I would have loved to have been there, to just be a fly on the wall, just to be able to witness that. I mean, what, what a picture that would be, that, that you see tongues of fire coming from, from heaven, and, it, and it's blessing God's church, and all of a sudden they're speaking in other tongues, and, and the Holy Spirit is, has poured out. I would have loved to have been there. I would have loved to, received, to have received the power of the Spirit of God. It is one of my favorite stories in Scripture. But it's also one of the most troubling stories for me in Scripture. It's one of the most troubling stories for me because this is not a singular event. What do I mean with that? I mean that if you read the book of Acts, you'll find that the outpouring of the Holy Spirit didn't just happen in, in Acts chapter 2. It's like the Holy Spirit is available wholesale in the book of Acts. I mean, if you, if you follow that, you, you keep reading the book, and, and, and the disciples, they end up coming up to individuals in their journey. And, and one of the things that they ask them is, have you received the Holy Spirit? And if the people say, no, no, we don't even know anything about the Holy Spirit, they would just lay hands on them, and boom, they would receive the Holy Spirit. It's available wholesale in, in the book of Acts and throughout the New Testament. Just, just read it. If they want the Spirit of God, they receive the Spirit of God. And that bothers me because I want the Spirit of God, and, it, and, and the Spirit doesn't seem to be as available now these days as it has been in the past, and so I'm, I'm really bothered about that. Well, for you biblical scholars, you might be thinking, well, pastor, maybe that's because of Matthew chapter 23. We talked a little bit about Matthew 23 today in Sabbath school. Maybe it's because Jesus had looked out and said, your temple is left to you desolate. And Acts chapter 7, we have the stoning of Stephen, and, and we had the, this movement from the chosen people to the priesthood of all believers, and because all of that is happening, God needed to pour out His Spirit. Maybe that's why there was this amazing outpouring of the Spirit of God in Acts chapter 2. 
Well, yeah, that sounds really good, and I think all of that is correct, but the problem is it's not just in the book of Acts that you see the outpouring of the Spirit of God. If you look at the history of Christian spirituality, you will find that God, God's Spirit was available to the church all throughout generations. Let me show you an example. This is the Moravians. The Moravians in 1727. How many of you have studied the Moravians? Oh, good. Well, let me tell you a little bit about the Moravians. There's a guy by the name of Count Zinzendorf. Nicholas Ludwig Zinzendorf. And as a, as a small child, he gave his life to the Lord. He said, you know, my, my life is going to be dedicated to the Lord. Sometimes we, we look at our young people and we're like, ah, you know, they need to grow up to do things. But young people are, can be powerful advocates of Jesus Christ. As a young man, he gave his life to, to Jesus and and. As he grew up and he went to what would be the equivalent of college these days, he would have all these friends that would invite him to go here and go there and do this and do that. And he would always turn them down. Instead, he would invite them to come with him to study the Bible. I think that that's pretty powerful. We live in a world right now where there's so many influences that are pulling us here and there, asking us to go here and there. And God needs the people that are willing to stand up for the word of God. All your friends, all they're waiting for is an invitation to find out about the lovely Jesus that you serve. That's what they're waiting for. Eventually, he grows up, he graduates, he grows up, he's now the count. And during this period of time, yes, it's almost up to the point of 1798. We all remember what happened in 1798. It's almost there, but it's still 1727. There's still persecution that is happening. And, and, and he's thinking to himself, what can I do to help Christians? And he says, I've got it. I, got, I know exactly what I can do to help Christians. I can't protect Christians outside of my boundaries, but I can protect them if they are on my property. And so he makes this, this open invitation that any Christians that want to live on his property, they can do so and they can worship in the way that they want to worship. And he gets a couple of hundred or so Christians to take him up on that. And everything is, is fine for the first few days. But then all of a sudden, they start fighting against each other. Why? Because they're from different denominations. Different beliefs. I mean, think about it. We're, we're Seventh-day Adventists, and we fight amongst ourselves, and we're just one, one denomination. Imagine putting all these denominations living in the same community and trying to talk theology and religion and spirituality, and all of a sudden, he's got a big fight in his hands, and this is what, not what he intended. So he, he begins to pray with a couple of his friends, and they start praying over what to do, and then he has this brilliant idea. He says, he, here's, here's what I'm going to do. He sits down with every single family, and he says, I need you to do two things. Number one, I'm going to ask you to put your differences aside. Now, his asking them to put their differences aside is not like what we talk about today. You hear all, all of these uh, folks today talking about, hey, just let, put, put, your, put your differences aside, just, you know, your beliefs, you know, just kind of bring them all together maybe in one pot. We take a golden paddle, we'll stir that around, and out comes some kind of belief. That's not what he was talking about. He said, put your differences aside. In other words, put them on the shelf for now because I'm going to ask you one other thing. Commit to praying with me like mad that God would lead us into truth. Every single family agreed. And the story that I'm going to share with you now is what happened when they began to pray. The Moravian revival of 1727 was thus preceded and then sustained by extraordinary praying. A spirit of grace, unity, and supplications grew among them. On July 16, many of the community covenanted together on their own accord to meet often to pour out their hearts in prayer and hymns. On August the 15th, Nicholas Ludwig von Zinzendorf, the Count, spent the whole night in prayer with about 12 or 14 others following a large meeting for prayer at midnight. Uh, there was great emotion there. On Sunday, August the 10th, Pastor Roth, while leading the service at Hernhut, was overwhelmed by the power of the Lord about noon. He sank down in the dust before God. So did the whole congregation. They continued till midnight in prayer and singing, weeping and 
praying. And on Wednesday, August the 13th, listen to this. On Wednesday, August the 13th, the Holy Spirit was poured out on them all. Their prayers were answered in ways far beyond one's expectation. Well, pastor, how do we know it was the real Holy Spirit? How do, how do we know that this, that because, you know, there's a lot of fake stuff that's happening. How do we know it's the real Holy Spirit? What, what, is, what does the Bible say? By their fruit, you will what? You will know them. By their fruit, you will know them. Here, here's the fruit. Many of them decided to set aside certain times for continued earnest prayer. This is not working really well. <laughs> On August 26, 24 men and 24 women covenanted together to continue praying in intervals of one hour each. Here, here's what they decided. They said, you know, in the Old Testament, in the temple, the lights were never to go out in the temple. They were to burn 24 hours a day. And if that's what God wanted in his temple, then we should be doing the very same thing now. And so what, what we need to do is we need to pray 24 hours a day. So they divided up into teams of two, and they gave each team one hour, and they faithfully prayed 24 hours a day. Day and night, each hour allocated by lots to different people. On August 27, this new regulation began. Others joined the intercessors, and the number involved increased to 77. They all carefully, I may have to go back up to the top. Is there a way to, to, to raise that receiver somewhere? Yeah, where I, can, where I can see it. There you go. Observe the hour which had been appointed for them. The intercessors had a weekly meeting where prayer needs were given to them. And it wasn't just them. It wasn't just the adults. The children themselves said, wait a second. If our parents are praying, then we should be praying as well. The children, also touched powerfully by God, began a similar plan among themselves. Those who heard their infant supplications were moved. The children's prayers and supplications had a powerful effect on the whole community. The astonishing prayer meeting, listen up, the astonishing prayer meeting beginning in 1727 went on for, what does that say? 100 years. 100 years. It was unique, known as the hourly intercession uh, it involved relays of men and women in prayer without ceasing made to God. The prayer also led to action, especially evangelism, and more than 100 missionaries left the village community in the next 25 years, all constantly supported in prayer. Just about everybody that you can think of during that period of time, all of the religious giants, uh, John Wesley, all of the religious giants were all influenced by the Moravians because of prayer. Paris, Maine, September 14, 1849. This is during the time that we call the Sabbatarians. What, uh, on, on what year, what day and what year was the Great Disappointment? October 22, 1844. The thought was that Jesus was going to come because William Miller, he had sort of misinterpreted, uh, misunderstood. He, he saw that the that um, the, the temple was, was to be cleansed, and he thought that the temple was, the sanctuary was going was gonna to be this earth, and so he thought that that cleansing of the sanctuary was going to be Jesus coming. He didn't understand that that, that was a change in the phase of what Jesus' ministry was doing. He would go from the holy place into the most holy place on October 22, 1844. And there was tons and tons of believers that were waiting for, for Jesus to come. Historians tell us that at that great disappointment day, they wept and wept till the day dawned. You can only imagine thinking that you're going to go to heaven and that Jesus is coming back and he doesn't come. And after that, many left the faith. Others, they embraced fanaticism. And there was a small little group, a, a small group that said, no, hold on a second. We did all the studying. We did all the praying. We've done all the calculations. All of this is right. We must not be understanding something correctly. And that group ended up turning into the Sabbatarians. This period of time right, right here happens during the Sabbatarian time of uh, right after the Millerite time. What, uh, what year was the Seventh-day Adventist Church established? 1863. So it's, this is before the SDA church has been established. September 14, 1849. Fanaticism was rampant. F.T. Howland long trouble, troubled God's children with his errors and harsh spirit. During prayer, the Spirit of the Lord rested upon Brother S. Howland. 
There appeared to be a light around him, and his face was, was white as he approached F.T. Hallen. No relation between these two guys. And in the name of the Lord, bid him leave the assembly of the saints. Said he, you have torn the hearts of God's children and made them bleed. Leave the house or God will smite you. That rebellious spirit never before known to fear or to yield sprang for his hat and in terror left the house. Let me just deviate for a second to talk a little bit about what I've seen over the years as I've had the opportunity to travel from church to church. It seems like in just about every church that I have been to, there seems to be individuals that tear at the heart of the people in the church. And they've been there for a long, long time. And we as Adventists seem to be really, really good at calling out sin, aren't we? Oh, brother, you should not be doing that. Have you read the Ten Commandments? I mean, did you read what Ellen White said on that? We do a fantastic job of pointing out everybody's sins. But when it comes to character, we don't check character. We let these individuals come in and tear at the fabric of the church. And friends, I believe that God is going to bring us into judgment for that. Listen to what happens next when this particular individual leaves. If I can get the slide to change. Maybe not. There we go. The power of God descended something as it did on the day of Pentecost. And five or six who had been deceived and led into error and fanaticism fell prostrate to the floor. Parents confessed to their children and children to their parents and to one another. Brother Jay and Andrews, with deep feeling, exclaimed, I would exchange a thousand errors for one truth. Such a scene of confessing and pleading with God for forgiveness we have seldom witnessed. 1849, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And, and notice, it came only after the person that was tearing at the fabric of the church was asked to leave. Now, I'm not telling you to start kicking people out of the church. <laughs> don't, don't come say, hey, the voice of prophecy came from the U.S., and they said, just kick everybody out. That, that's, that's not what I'm saying. There's a process. There's, there's a Matthew 18 process. There's, there's, there's this process. But know that we have been tasked to bring people through, through an understanding or to an understanding that there's a righteous way to walk. And if they continue tearing at the fabric of the church, then the church can't grow that way. The Spirit of God can't grow that way. Go back. Too far. There we go. All right. All right. Here's... Here's what I'm bothered about. The Spirit of God has been poured out. I can go through all kinds of different stories in, in history of, of Christianity and talk about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I've just chosen a couple of different stories. But here's what bothers me. The Spirit of God has been, has been available for a long, long time in the church. But we're struggling. We're struggling. Let me ask you a question. Let me show, see a show of hands. How many of you have been, have been Adventists? Let's just go Christians. How many of you have been Christians for, say, 10 years? Raise your hand. If you've been a Christian for 10 years, raise your hand. All right. Uh, 20 years. 30 years. Still see some hand. 40 years. 50 years. I used to say... 50, and I had to put my hand down, but I just turned 50 this year, so I'm old. All right, let's, let's just go 60. How many of you have been 60? You are not 60 years old. <laughs> Either that or you have found the fountain of youth, and you and I need to talk after this. 60, I see a 60. Is that the only hand? No, I see a, a few. Uh, 70? Do we, do we still have 70? 75. Still have 75. No, no, no 75. Seven, how, how long have you been in the church or a Christian? Yeah. <laughs> he doesn't want to give his age. <laughs> 73 years. Any, 74 years. All right. Congratulations. Any more, anybody more than 74 years? We won't shame you or anything. All right. Con congratulations. Let, let, let's, let's, let's go with that. In the congregation this morning, we have, give or take, whatever it is that you happen to have, at least 74 years of Christian experience. Now listen to the question closely. Don't get excited and raise your hand before I finish the question. Here's my question. 
in those 74 plus or minus years, in those 74 plus or minus years, how many of you have ever witnessed or experienced, don't get excited, have ever witnessed or experienced the outpouring of the Holy Spirit like unto Pentecost? And if you're struggling with what that means, remember what happened in Acts chapter 2. They were all in one accord, in one place, the heavens opened up, fire came down from heaven, and they spoke in other tongues. How many of you have ever experienced the outpouring of the Holy Spirit like unto Pentecost? Raise your hand. Nobody? Maybe one? Well, maybe you didn't understand my question. <laughs> one more time. I, I think most of you understood my question. Does that bother you? Does it bother you that we have been chosen as a people of the last days to preach the everlasting gospel, but we haven't seen the power of the Holy Spirit like unto Pentecost for years? It's been over a hundred years that the Seventh-day Adventist Church has received the power of the Holy Spirit like unto Pentecost. Friends, that, that's the elephant in the room. We come to church every Sabbath, we sing the songs, we, 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 we pray the prayers, we, we preach the sermons, but we are powerless. We are living powerless lives, powerless homes, powerless schools, powerless churches. We have a powerless message because we are lacking the power of the Holy Spirit. We have not seen it in the church like unto Pentecost in years. And yet... We're waiting for Jesus to come. That's not a good thing. <laughs> because if you read in Amos chapter 5, it talks about calling for the day of the Lord, and the day of the Lord is destruction. Now, listen, I'm not saying that the Spirit of God is not working. I think in the Sabbath school this morning, it was very, very clear. The fact that we are here this morning means that the Spirit of God is at work. Genesis chapter 6 said that the Lord looked down, he saw that the wickedness of man was great and every intent of the heart was evil continually. We can't even get up in the morning and come to church unless the Spirit of God is working on us. But I'm saying we haven't seen the power of the Spirit of God in former or latter rain fashion in a very long time. And if that's the case, and God in his infinite wisdom knew that would be the case, if that's the case, if, if you have come to church this morning and you have found out that we are lacking the Spirit of God, God gives us a formula. It's there on the board. Second Chronicles chapter 7. And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for an house of sacrifice. Remember that, that Solomon built the temple and, and he's dedicating the temple. This is the story. If I shut up heaven that there be no Rain. Now, in the, in the Old Testament, this rain, this was probably talking agriculturally. They were trying, God was talking to them in an agricultural fashion. But in today, because all of these things have been written in Scripture and they haven't been placed there just for us to say, oh, that's a beautiful story. It has to have some kind of application to us. In Scripture, rain is equal to what? It's symbolic of what? Rain is symbolic of what? Oh, you guys are quiet this morning. Holy Spirit, reign is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. So God is saying, listen, if you come to church in 2024 and there is this crazy American speaking up front and you realize that the power of the Holy Spirit has not been poured out in a hundred plus years like unto Pentecost, here's what you're to do. Next slide. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves. I'm just going to have you do the slides. That's fantastic. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Next. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will hear their land. That's the formula. You've read through this before. You've studied it before. But this morning, I want to quickly go through what this means. There's five parts. Next slide. If my people, that's my people which are called by my name, humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. This is the formula for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that God gave us and for church growth. Let's start. Next slide. 
If my people, then I. This is a, this is a, a uh, sort of a causal relationship. God says, if my people will do this, then what? Then I will. Now, what's interesting about these causal relationships is the opposite is also true. If my people will not do this, then what? Then I can't. Then I can't. And it's really, really simple. God says, guys, here, here it is. If you will do these things, then I will bless you. But if you will not do these things, then I cannot bless you. Because remember, the whole of the Old Testament is so that they might know that I am God. And when we don't do things the way that God wants them to do things, uh, wants us to do things, we end up taking the, the glory to ourselves. And we have not been called to take the glory to ourselves. We have been called to uplift Jesus Christ. If you will do this, then I will. If you don't, then I cannot. Let's start. Next slide. My people, number one. My people who are called by my name. Next. I have manifested, this is John chapter 17, verse 6. By the way, John chapter 17 is probably the most powerful chapter in Scripture. This is what I, why I wanted to come down. I'm more of a teacher than I am a preacher. Because then I can't walk the halls and look at you. And this way you can't fall asleep either, because then I can tap you on the shoulder. John chapter 17, I believe, is one of the most powerful chapters in Scripture. Somebody tell me, why is it the most powerful chapter in Scripture? I was preaching one day in a church, um, and I asked a question, and they just kind of looked at me like they weren't expecting me to ask a question and to respond. And at the end, uh, one of the church members came up to me and said, Pastor, you cannot ask questions during a sermon. Well, it does get me in trouble at times, but I, I, it's, just, it's just me. John chapter 17, one of the most powerful chapters in Scripture, if not the most powerful chapter in Scripture. Tell me why. Jesus' prayer, okay. Why is that powerful, though? He's praying for us. Yes, what else? Giving glory to God. More, more, more. Think deep, 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 deep. I heard a little voice here somewhere. Maybe it's the American accent. <laughs> what was that now? Teaches us to pray. Perfect. Beautiful. Anything else? Last prayer before the cross. Great. I heard a verse. For... Thank you. We'll get to that in just a second. Listen, here's why it's the most powerful chapter in Scripture. In heaven, you remember that Lucifer wanted what? He wanted to be like... God. He wanted God's throne. He was upset that he did not get called into the, into the council of the Godhead as if he's got anything to bring to the table. I mean, can you imagine God calling you today and saying, hey, I'd like you to come and talk to us. You know, we were thinking about this idea and we'd really like to see what your opinion is. Is God going to do that for me? No, I've got nothing to bring to the table. But Lucifer thought he belonged there. And God would not allow him to come into the councils of the Godhead. And he does something ridiculous in John chapter 17. He invites us into the heavenly council of the Godhead. In John chapter 17, we see God speaking to God. Is that important? Do you think we should listen? When God speaks to God, that's probably one of the most important things that has ever been recorded in Scripture. Here it is. I have manifested thy name there's that concept of the name, unto the men which thou givest me out of, the, out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Next slide. I, and now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father. Keep through thine own name, here it is again, those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. What does it mean to have the name of God? Notice how God marries the concept of the name of God in oneness in John chapter 17. To have the name of God means that we are one. Let me ask you this morning. Are you one? Is the Belfast Church one? Don't answer that. Is the Irish Mission one? Is the TED one? I can tell you that the NAD, well, I won't talk about the NAD. Is it possible that one of the reasons the Spirit of God has not poured itself out, himself out on the church today is because 
We are not one. Next slide. God is looking for a people in one accord. Element number one. Element number one. God is looking for a people in one accord. Element number two. Next slide. Humble themselves. Next slide. Mark chapter 9, verses 14 through 18. You remember this story. And when he came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them. And the scribe is questioning with them. Next. And straightway all the people, when they beheld him, were greatly amazed. And running him, saluted him. Next. And asked... And he asked the scribes, what question we, ye with them? What story is this? Anybody remember what story this is? Jesus has gone up to the Mount of Transfiguration, remember? And he's come down. The disciples, some of the disciples went with him. Some of the disciples stayed, stayed there at the bottom. Next slide. And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. Next and where, wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth and gnasheth with his teeth, and, and pineth away, or pineth away. And I spake to the, thy, thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. Why, why could they not cast him out? They didn't have the Holy Spirit. Why else? What were they doing? What had they been spending their time doing? They, they weren't what? They weren't one. They weren't one because they were fighting with each other. And what were they fighting about? Who's going to be the greatest? Which one's going to sit on the left and the right hand? Who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? You see, they, they had forgotten. Next slide. They had forgotten this particular text. What does it say? It's not by might nor by power, but by what? My spirit, saith the Lord. They would have well remembered this next slide Luke chapter 2 verse 49 where Jesus said did you not know that I must be about what my father's business this morning you're sitting here in this church and I'm wondering whose business are you about have you been worried about building your own kingdom have you been worried about building your own house where you live and what you drive and what kind of education you have whose business are you about next slide major Ian Thomas as he is struggling with a relationship with God, he senses that God is telling him something. And this is what he senses God is telling him. This is now the thing you have got to realize. This is what he thinks God is telling him. You cannot have my life for your program. You can only have my life for my program. You see, it's not about us. It's about God. God has called us on this earth to do His will, not to do our will. Why don't we see greater success in soul winning and evangelism today? It's because we're, we're spending so much time talking about how should we do it? How should we find people that are interested? What kind of program can we design? What can we do to attract people into the church? Listen, friends, God never gave us the call to do any of that stuff. He's got that all taken care of. If we would just be a, a house of prayer, if we would just be a people of, of God. He would bring the people through the doors of our church. It's about his business, not our business. Next slide. Element number two, God is looking for a people about our father's business. What was element number one? Anybody remember? God is looking for a people in one accord. Element number two, God is looking for a people about our father's business. Element, element number three, prayer. Next slide. Matthew 21, 13, one of the most disturbing stories in Scripture happens two different times where Jesus walks into the temple and he overturns the table and he has a, he has a whip and he begins to whip the tables and uh, just a different picture of, of God. And after, after he does that, he says this, my house shall be called what? A house of prayer. My, call, my house shall be called a house of prayer. Is this house a house of prayer? We had a, a prayer session last, last week, five hours with Jesus. How many of you were here? Just a few. How many of you enjoyed that, that came? Some of you were completely surprised that it's actually not that difficult to pray for five hours. It's actually quite enjoyable. Is, is this house a house of prayer? For the Moravians, a house of prayer was praying 24 hours a day, seven days a week for 100 years. That was a house of prayer. Now, I'm not saying that that's what you need to do. But let me ask you, 
Have you as a church or you as a board or you as church leaders gotten together and asked that question, oh, Lord God, show us what a house of prayer looks like in Belfast? Have you asked that question? If you haven't done so, friends, then you may be behind in your journey to conquer Belfast for Jesus Christ. A house of prayer. This morning, I want to give you an opportunity to start. We started this with our prayer team last weekend, but I want to give you an opportunity to start becoming a house of prayer. There are these cards. They are labeled Mind Fit, but they'll work just as well. And I want to pass these out to you. I think we should have enough for each person. The deacons. Um, who are my deacons? The deacons were raptured. Now, here we go. All right, go, go ahead, deacons, and pass these out to each, to each individual. Now, what are these? This is basically the concept of Operation Andrew, based on, on the fact that Jesus went and called uh, Andrew, and Andrew went and called one other individual. I loved the children's story because it was exactly on this. It was, it was absolutely perfect. The reality is that if every single person here will go out and just get one person, then the church will double. And if then those people that are in the church, now that the church is double, if they will go out and just get one person, then you have four times what you originally had. And for those of you who are mathematicians, you realize that it does not take long to take the entire city that way. So how do we do it? Do we spend more money in Belfast? Do we come up with greater fantastic ideas of what could possibly speak to the, to the Northern Ireland mind? No, those things are fine. I think we need to strategize. I think we need to come up with, with relevant events. But I'm telling you, friends, because it's not me. It's the Bible. It's the Word of God. This is the answer to church growth right here. If you will take this card, and there's at least five slots in there. You may be able to write more. And you will write down five people that are on your heart that you want to invite to church, that you want to invite to receive Jesus Christ into their hearts, that you want to see come home, because that's what God has called us to do. He's called us to call a people home. We don't belong to this earth. And I don't, I don't know which, I don't know how many of you would want to stay on this miserable place. I'm done. I am, I am so tired. I'm tired of the wickedness. I'm tired of the violence. I'm tired of the, of, the, of the sin and the death. Right now, just a good friend of mine passed away just, uh, just, this, just this week. My mother-in-law died of cancer just a few years ago. It was devastating to our family. I don't know why we would want to stay on this earth any longer. God has called us to call a people home. If you will write down on this card five people, that you're going to ask diligently for God to grant you, he's going to give you the people on your list. Ellen White, uh, as she was heading into the, the great disappointment, she had a burden to share the love of Jesus with, with all of her friends, and so she made a list. That list was pretty long. It had, um, I think, over 50 people in it. Some were young, some were older. And so she ended up getting an appointment with every single one of those individuals that she wrote on her list. Every single one of them turned her down. As she talked to them about Jesus, every single one of them turned her down. She went home and began praying diligently over that list and reported later that God granted every single one of the names. Who's going to show up to the next event that we hold here? It'll be the people on your list. But listen, this has to be a culture. This just has, doesn't, is it doesn't work when it's just a thing. It, does, it doesn't work when you just put the names on there and you leave it on the table. Or when you put the names on it and you leave it on the Bible and never, never look at it. This is your commitment. You put your names on it and you begin to pray for this every single day. Sabbath morning, when you start Sabbath morning and you have worship up here, the pastor says, everybody take out your cards. You take out your cards and you have time to pray for them. When you have your prayer meeting, do you have a Wednesday night or Thursday night prayer meeting here? Wednesday, Wednesday, 
Everybody coming to Wednesday? Yeah, yeah. Everybody needs to come to Wednesday. Bring your cards. Because what are you going to do? You're going to pray over your cards. You're going to pray over your names. Right before you start board meeting, you're going to pull out your cards. Right before you start any of your Sabbath schools, you're going to pull out, pull out your card. When you're walking against each other here, you, you run into your buddy right before you start talking about whatever it is that you need to talk about. You're going to ask your buddy, do you have your card? Let's pray for the card. I guarantee that if we will take that kind of attitude, God will grant you everybody on the list. I was, um, how long do you guys usually preach here? I noticed that you didn't have a clock back here. I love churches that don't have the clock on the back. Yeah, but I can't see that way. <laughs> what, where are you going to go with Sabbath? I mean, you know, it's just a... Uh, I'll, 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 I'll try to wrap up as soon as I, I possibly can. But this is important. I was, um, I was at a church one day, and I, and, I, and I asked this question. I said, hey, listen, what if we, what if we decided, what if we committed as a church that we would, we would not work, each one of us would no longer work, I don't know what your work hours are here in Northern Ireland, but we would not work 40 hours a week. That's what it is in the U.S., 40 hours a week. What if we just worked 32 hours a week? And somebody said, well, what would you do, Pastor? What, what would we do with these other eight hours? Well, you would come to the church and you would pray like mad and then you would go out into the community. What if we did that here in Belfast? What if we just committed to work working 32 hours a week instead of 40 hours a week, and we all said we were going to come to the church, pray like crazy, and we'd go into the community. If we did that as a church, what do you think the results would be in the community? What do you think? Inspire people? I asked that question in a very large church, so large that it had like, like bleacher rows way, way in the back that you couldn't really see, and, and I saw somebody stand up in the back. A man stood in the back, and I could see that he was bothered. Couldn't really see, see his face real well, but I could see his head going back and forth, and he was actually grunting. He was making noises back there. You, you could just hear it. And then he yelled out, I guess the Lord would come. And the room was silent. And for one of the first times in my, lives, I, my life, I had nothing to say. Because he was right. You see, the issue in the Adventism is not that we don't know what to do. We don't have the courage to do it. I'm not telling you that that's what you need to do to be a house of prayer. What I am saying is that it is time for God's people to take praying seriously. We cannot finish this work and get off this miserable planet un until we start praying. And so I'm going to invite you to, to take this seriously. Next slide. God is looking for a people of prayer. Element number one, God is looking for a people in one accord. Element number two, God is looking for a people about our father's business. Element number three, God is looking for a people of prayer. We're going to go really quickly on the last two. Next slide. Seek my face. What does it mean to, to seek my face? This is uh, another one of my favorite places in Scripture. Next slide. John chapter 5, verse 39. Search the, the Scriptures, for in them you think you have what? Eternal life, and they... And they are they that testify of me. Looking at the word of God, we are looking for Jesus. Next slide. Second Chronicles, one of my favorite stories. Second Chronicles 34. Now in the 18th year of his reign, when he had purged the land and the house, he sent Shaphan, the son of Azalea. Next slide. And Messiah, the gunner of the city, and Joah, the son of Joahaz, the recorder to repair the house of the Lord his God. Next slide. Now, when they brought out the money that was brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found the book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. Next. Then Hilkiah answered and said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan. Next slide. Then Shaphan the scribe told the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest had given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. Next slide. And it came to pass when the king had heard the words of the law that he rent his clothes. Why did he, why did he, why did he tear his clothes? He was frustrated? Frustrated at what? What did he read in that? What do you think? He was reading the book of the law. What did he see? He saw the rebellion of the people. He saw how they had been rebellious. He saw what, what the consequences of what that rebellion was. And remember, he sent, he sent to, the, to the prophet and he said... Tell me if, if this is correct. And, and he was told, this is correct. So he rent his clothes. Uh, 
Praise God he found the book of the law, right? Amen. But let me ask you a question. How do you lose the book of the law? How do you lose it? Have we in the Seventh-day Adventist church lost the book of the law? I'm not saying that you don't know where your Bible is. I think every good Adventist has 10 or 20 on their shelves. Just about every, every uh, language and, and interpretation and whatever. It's just all there. I'm saying are we, are we reading the book of the law? Are we reading the Word of God? Are we spending time in the Word of God? Some years ago when I started preaching, I, was, I came from law enforcement, as some of you know. I spent time in law enforcement and the fire service, and so I was thrown into ministry. I came kicking and screaming. I didn't want to be an, uh, a minister, but that's what God said you had to do. And I remember one of my first sermons. Uh, I, I was preaching, and I came, I came down after I was preaching, and I went to the back to shake hands, not because... Anybody had told me that that's what I was supposed to do, but because I'd been in church my whole life, and that's what I saw preachers do, so I thought that's what I was supposed to do. So I went down there, and I, and I was shaking people's hands. And I remember that this, this big, big guy, I mean, I just, I remember he was big, big shoulders, tall, and he took my hand. He was not an Adventist, but he was married to an Adventist girl. He took my hand, and it was one of these death grips. You, you, you've probably shook, shaken, shaken hands with people that, that they're just monstrous. And he took my hand, and he's just squeezing for all his might, and I'm thinking to myself, he's going to kill me. And he looked at me straight in the face. He was so serious. He's holding me and, he's, and he says, thank you. Thank you for bringing the Bible back into the church. I went home and I thought to myself, I have no idea what that's all about. But years in ministry and having the opportunity to preach and see so many churches around the world, and I can tell you I know exactly what he's talking about. I don't know what we're preaching from up here. What, what are we doing? What are we doing? Well, we have been called to preach the word of God. Next slide. God is looking for a people of the book. That's who we are. There is a uniqueness to Adventism. And, and there's a couple of things that we do really, really well. One of those things is the health message. We do that really, really well. Some people take that way too far, but, <laughs> but we do that really, really well. The, the other thing that we do really, really well is the Bible. We have been given the Word of God and a greater understanding of the, of the Word of God than most people have, and that's what we're supposed to be preaching. And the things that we spend our time talking about from the platform and in the church, you see, we forget that when we come into worship, we have walked into the most holy place. We've disconnected the sanctuary and the most holy place in worship, and now we, we talk about all kinds of stuff. Element number one, God is looking for a people in one accord. Element number two, God is looking for a people about our Father's business. Element number three, God is looking for a people of prayer. And element number four, God is people looking for a people of the book. Last one. Turn from your wicked ways. Now, this is actually a, uh, the first sermon in a six-part series, which we're not going to do this morning because we don't have time. <laughs> Okay, we'll do it. No, I'm just kidding. We have the, the mind fit event, and I've got to get ready for that. If we were talking about, if we had the, that six-part series, there would be one, one sermon dedicated to each one of these. And, and this one here, Turn From Your Wicked Ways, we would have a whole lot of information. And I would talk about sin. I would talk about repentance. I would talk about all kinds of stuff here. One of, the, one of the stories that I would probably tell is the story of Mary. As Mary has been caught in adultery, and she has been been dragged and thrown at the feet of Jesus, and Jesus begins to write on the sand, and, and, um, and then everybody leaves, and he looks at her, and, and he says, neither would I condemn you, or neither do I condemn you. Go and do whatever you want to do. Is that what he says? What did he say? Go and sin no more. You see, this is, that's what true repentance is. True repentance is is not only giving it to the Lord, but it's also walking away from our sin and saying, I'm not going to do that anymore. We'd spend a lot more time here if we had the time, but we don't have the time. I want to just pick on one little item. Next slide. Jeremiah 25, verses 3 through 5. From the 13th year of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, even unto this day, that is the three and 20th year, the word of the Lord hath come unto me, and I have spoken unto you, rising early and speaking, but ye have not hearkened. In Scripture, who are the ones that God elected to point out the errors of the people, to call them out of sin? It was the prophets. Next slide. 
And the Lord hath sent unto you all his servants the prophets, rising early and sending them. But ye have not hearkened nor inclined your ear to hear. Next slide. They said, turn ye again now, every one from his evil way. This sounds like 2 uh, Corinthians. And from the evil of your doings, and dwell in the land that the Lord hath given unto you and to your fathers forever and ever. But we, we, just, we just wouldn't, wouldn't listen. Next slide. Revelation 12, 17 says this, And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. What is the testimony of Jesus Christ? What is the main testimony of Jesus Christ? Here's your test. Anybody know? Scripture. The Word of God is the main testimony of Jesus Christ. It is divine revelation. It is the only divine revelation. Next slide. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Number one, it's the Bible. Number two, it's what the prophets have written. And we in the Seventh-day Adventist Church believe that we have a modern-day prophet. What's, what's her name? Ellen White. Let me, let me share with you a quick journey, and then we'll close on, on Ellen White. I always marvel at individuals that don't want to listen to Ellen White. But I understand it. And the reason that I understand it is because as I grew up, I grew up in a conservative Hispanic home. And my parents read Ellen White a lot. And every time that I had asked to do something, especially on Saturday, I was told no. And when I asked why not, they would say, because Ellen White said no. Hey, Dad, can I do this? No. Why? Ellen White said no. Hey, Mom, can I do No. Ellen White said no. I hated her. I absolutely, she ruined my childhood. I mean, she was the no lady. And, and when, I, when I became an, an adult and I, and I started in law enforcement, I, I went through this incredible spiritual struggle. I would walk into work, and I was, at, at the time I was working as an undercover narcotics uh, agent, and so we had this, uh, what we called the duck blind, was where, where we all hung out and did undercover work, and we had offices in there, and, and I would walk into the office, and, and this partner of mine, he was Baptist, he would, uh, he would call me into his office, and, he, and he'd say, hey, did you see this verse? And we'd sit down and he'd show me a verse in the Bible and it seemed like it spoke against everything that I had ever been taught in the Seventh-day Adventist church. And he did this day in and day out. And it got to the point where I started questioning everything. I started questioning the schools that I went to, the sermons that I had heard, the Pathfinder Club that I had been to, the, 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 the Sabbath school classes that I'd, that I'd been it, it, I questioned everything and I definitely questioned Ellen White. I thought it was all a lie. I said, it's been, it's been all a lie. Everybody has lied to me. I have lived an incredible lie this entire time. And I remember praying one day and saying, I was not a huge man of prayer at the time, but, but I, I knew I didn't want to be stuck on this earth. I was, I was working and, and, and living this crazy messed up life with all of these criminals. I was seeing 95 to 99% of the evil in the world, and I, and I knew I did not want to be a part of that. I wanted to be in a place where God had promised beauty. And so I started praying, and I said, God, I, I need to find out truth. I need to know what the truth is. I just want to be in truth. God took me to two places. He took me, number one, to the book of Acts in the, in the Bible. And then I said, Lord, I need to find out about this Ellen White lady because this is a big part of this church, and if she's a lie, then I need out. And so I was impressed to read Acts of the Apostles which before that I would never pick up the book to read. But I was desperate and I needed to find out. And so I picked up, I, I didn't own one, I bought one of the newer ones. And I noticed when I opened the chapter to chapter one that they had the Bible reference of what that chapter was over printed on this Acts of the Apostles. And I thought, I know exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to open up the chapter, I'm going to see what the Bible reference is, I'm going to read it in the Bible, and then I'm going to read the chapter. And I did that systematically through the entire book of Acts and to the entire book of Acts of the Apostles. And at the end of that, something amazing happened. One, I was converted. And probably one of the first times in my adult life I accepted Christ as my personal Savior. I saw that the, 
that the Seventh-day Adventist church is the true remnant church of Bible prophecy. But I found a church in the pages of the New Testament that I had never been a member of. What the church looks like today and what it looked like in the New Testament and what it looked like in early Adventism, that's a different church. It's a completely different church. We have wandered away from the mission. And that's when the, the burning started to happen inside to do something about it. That's why I'm a minister today. It was time to call the church to come back to its roots. Something else happened. I fell in love with Ellen White. That's amazing. <laughs> that, that was just amazing. And, and over the years, in fact, I fell in love with her so much that I went to school and part of what I studied uh, in school, I studied systematic theology, but I also studied uh, church history and it was Adventist church history and it was so that I could find out more about the church and find out more about Ellen White. She is the most balanced individual I have ever seen. The problem is that we don't tell the story. We, we use her like a whip, but we don't tell her story. We don't tell her humanity. And if you read the whole thing, you know one of the problems? Well, I'll tell you. Let me, let me get to the, the last slide here, the last couple of slides. God's calling for a people of the testimony. That's the last one. But go to the threefold problem. There's a threefold problem with Ellen White. I mean, I'll tell you what the problem is. Number one, we don't read her. She, read, she wrote almost 100,000 pages. How many of you have read everything that Ellen White has written? Raise your hand. Not, not even close. I came to one of our historians a few years ago, and I asked him, have you read everything that she... And he's, and he's one of the top historians in Adventism today for the Adventist church. I said, have you read everything she's written? And he cocked his head over to the left and he said, almost. He's not even read her completely. So we talk, we talk about things that we don't even understand. We haven't read her. Number two, when we do read her, we read her selfishly. We're arguing with a brother or a sister and we go home and now the worst thing that could ever have been invented is the ability to search Ellen White's writings. Because we get on our computer and we... And we Tick whatever it is that we were, were wanting to see, and then we see about 200 and something hits, and we start reading until we find the one that we think supports our point. We don't read the rest of them. We come to church the next Sabbath, and we come to brother so-and-so, and we say to brother, hey, brother, I, this week it troubled me so much. I was fasting and praying. You weren't fasting and praying. And this is what I found. Have you ever read this? And you give it to them and behind you, yeah, yes. We read her selfishly. If you would read the whole thing, everything that she said, you would come out with a balanced perspective. It's the same about the scripture. If you read the entire Bible, the whole thing, you'd come up with a balanced perspective. And here's the third point. Did you know? that there is not a soul in the entire world that has an issue with Ellen White. Not a soul. You know what the problem is? Ellen White had a twofold passion. I agree with Dr. Merlin Burt with this. Ellen White had a twofold passion. She was passionate about the love of God. So she went out to show the love of God because she had a very misunderstanding of who God was when she grew up. And number two, she is the prophet to Scripture. She leads us to the Bible. You know what the problem is with people when they're thinking about Ellen White? They don't have a problem with her. They have a problem with Scripture. We don't like what Scripture is telling us to do. We don't like what Scripture is asking us to change. Scripture is like a two-edged sword. And so we take it out on the prophet, but it's not the prophet we're taking it out on. It's Scripture itself. Listen, I'm going to encourage you to spend time in the Word of God and spend time in her writings. They're, they're beautiful. But know, know and understand that Scripture is divine revelation. And the only reason we believe that Ellen White is a prophet is because she is proved as a prophet through Scripture. That's the only reason. Every individual has to be weighed against divine revelation. But when the prophet passes, and we're told in the last days, Joel says that we will, we will see the young and the old women and, and men, we will see them prophesy. And when people begin to say that, hey, I've received a prophecy, what are you to do? Check it against Scripture. But when the person passes like Ellen White, 
Friends, don't reject what God has given us in the last days. Five things. Next slide, and we'll close. A people in one accord, a people about our Father's business, a people of prayer, a people of the book, a people of the testimony. I guarantee, not because it's my guarantee, but it's God's guarantee. If you will take those five pillars, embrace those five pillars, and make those the foundation of your church, you will see church growth unlike anything you have ever seen. Let me pray with you. Father in heaven. Lord, we've, we've gone a little long this morning, but we're talking truths, Father, eternal truths. Lord, I'm, I'm praying for this congregation. I'm praying for this city. You have claimed this city like, like Nineveh. And sometimes, Lord, many times we, sh- we set our, our sights too low. Somehow we believe that only a few will listen. But the reality, Father, is that you've got there first. You're already working with thousands of individuals around this church in, in different homes and uh, different locations and, and, and jobs. You're, you're, you're visiting their minds. You're, you're, your spirit is, is troubling them. You're already working on these individuals. You have thousands of people that are actually ready to walk through the doors of this church right now. You just can't trust us enough to bring them in. And so this morning, Father, we're asking that you forgive us and that you help us, Lord, to hear your voice. I pray that you will pour your spirit out on this church in a powerful way. And that, Father, they will prepare the city of Belfast for your coming. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. believe that the Spirit of God can be poured out on this church in such a powerful way that it can be the catalyst to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit throughout the entire world. It could start right here. I've not yet had a church take me up on this as I've shared the presentation in different places. But if this church would have the courage to embrace the formula that God put in 2 Chronicles, God would bless you with the Holy Spirit. And how wonderful would it be? The place that saved Christianity in the first place 
is the place that the outpouring of the Holy Spirit would happen. Let's pray. Father, Lord, you're just waiting. You're waiting for people. A people to stand, to be counted. A people not to worry about what others are thinking. A people that will say, I'm going to be faithful no matter what. Let it be us, Father. Let, let, it, let it be this church right here in Belfast. Let us embrace what we have learned this morning and allow you to bring us into unity. Let us be about your business. Let us transform into a house of prayer, focusing on the book and on your testimony. Lord, I pray that you bless us this Sabbath in Jesus' name. Amen.